if you are thinking about getting into home distillation as a hobby, and you should guys, it's an amazing hobby to get into. One of the first questions uh, you're gonna wanna answer is what size equipment you should be looking at to get started. How's it going, Chasers? I hope you're having a kick-ass week. I'm Jesse, and this is Still It. Uh, so like I said in the intro team, uh, the size of the equipment that you choose is going to, well, I mean, it's going to impact everything you do until you decide to buy a different set of kit, right? Or build a different kit. So it's worth taking a little bit of time to get it, I wouldn't say right, but get something that's right for you, uh, especially when you're deciding to get into the hobby because it's going to influence whether or not uh, you have a smooth transition into the hobby, how much you enjoy it, how easy things are, and how much time you're gonna be putting into things as well. So, uh, right from the beginning, let's sort of get the, the main part of this out of the way. The, the, the one thing you want to take away from this is there's a sort of a, a top limit to things and a bottom limit to things in terms of size. I'm going to suggest that you do not even consider anything below the 5 to 10 litre mark. And I would strongly suggest that if you're getting into the hobby, um, 50 liters is probably the the upper limit of where you want to get to to start with. So let's first of all talk about the upper limit because big is better, right? <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, but the thing you're going to run into is well, cost for one. Depending on your budget, things can get very very expensive uh, just in the pure amount of materials you're going to be buying, um, shipping costs, all of those sort of things, for sure. But there's also a time component here as well, guys. So the larger the pot you have, the more product you're going to be tempted to put into it or are going to have to put into it in terms of its minimal fill level uh, for every run you make. And that is going to take up lots and lots of time. The way to combat lots and lots of time is to buy a wider and wider and wider uh, column as well, especially if you're doing reflux. So once again, if you have the money to throw at it, sure. And you're not worried about cost, sure. Um, you don't need to take lots of time to run a larger still. Just keep it in mind though. The second really big thing that you need to know about larger setups on a home distilling level is just the logistics of things. So things that um, can be taken for granted using a 20 litre setup suddenly become a bit of a problem when you start getting up to 100 or 200 litres or something silly like that. And um, by the way, two people might start asking questions about whether you really are doing this for uh, personal consumption. Just saying. Uh, anyway, wh what I'm saying is logistics, just cleaning things, moving things, transferring liquid from one place to the other. Uh, when you're doing a little 20 litre still, uh, you fill it up, you run the still, you pick it up, you tip it in the sink. What's left if you're not keeping it? Uh, not a problem. If you've got a 100 litre still, however, you're going to find it pretty hard to pick that thing up and tip it in the sink. You're going to have to start looking at things like um, pumps or gravity fed situations. You're going to have to really be careful about, about where things are. Uh, Little things like you fill up your fermenter and then move it to your fermentation chamber or to where it's going to be fermenting at the right temperature. If that's 100 litres, 200 litres, you ain't moving it until it's empty. <laughs> Unless you have a forklift. That's one of the things that uh, sometimes people don't think about when they look at the larger side of things. All right, now let's look on the smaller side. Uh, the problem with the smaller stuff is that you really start running into problems with basically fidelity in terms of cuts. And it gets very, very difficult to be able to make any sort of meaningful cut on a very small still. So even at five liters, this is pretty tricky. 10 liters, it's pretty tricky. But at least at five or 10 liters, you have the ability to do, at least you know, on a, a five liter still or a 10 liter still, you have the ability to make 15 liters of wash and then strip it down in multiple stripping runs and then perform a spirit run on the end. And then technically, or you're kind of making cuts on 15 liters of wash rather than five liters. And that would kind of be the, the absolute bare minimum that I would suggest you go down to in terms of being able to really create a product that you're gonna be happy with later on. 
So now that we've sort of set an upper limit and a bottom limit, uh, I'm going to break that into three sort of different categories and suggest it for three different types of people. The first category is, oh, I'm dripping on camera. How embarrassing. Uh, the first category <laughs> is that sort of five to 10, maybe 15 liter range. Uh, and you're gonna be looking at something like this. The beauty of these sort of things are the exact opposite of what I was saying about with the large equipment, right? It is so easy to pick this up, plop it down somewhere, run it. Um, you can clean it up if you're not like me when you're finished. <laughs> clean it properly and pop it away in the cupboard and it's not going to take up lots of space. You don't need a dedicated brew area, distilling area for this sort of equipment. It is just unopposing and easy and cheap to get into. Uh, and the great thing is that these size stills, I still use this all the time when I'm making test batches of things, especially, especially something like a, a gin, for example. It's a great little size, even when you progress through the hobby. So buying this sort of equipment is not uh, a throw away of money if you carry on into the hobby, but it's a very, very cheap way to get into it, to see if you really like it, to see if it's something you really wanna follow up without having to sit, spend lots of money from the get-go. The second level or size of equipment um, that I would sort of talk about is the, Probably the, the 20 to 30 litre range. This is the claw hammer still, which as you can see is very dusty. I need to give it some love. I should make something with this again, shouldn't I? I really should. Um, because it is a great little still. And honestly team, the, the, the reason that this sort of size is good is that it just, it's obvious, it sits between the two other sizes, right? It allows you a larger volume. It's still very portable and easy to move around. It's still at a size where you can whack it away into the, you know, the, the closet in the hallway. Um, you can put it away in the cupboard in the shed. It's not a whole lot of equipment, but it's starting to get to a relatively meaningful size uh, of product. And I know a lot of people sort of, when they watch my videos, they say, how do, you, how do you drink all this stuff that you're making? And the thing is I don't, because a lot of it sits on the shelf and gets better as it ages. So I'm not drinking my product more than maybe once or twice a week and maybe one or two glasses at a, at a time. It's nice, especially when you're gonna be aging stuff, to have a little bit more volume. So when you make that whiskey that you're gonna have sitting on the shelf for six months, a year, two years, when it's finally finished, <laughs> there's actually a, you know, a bottle or so of it that you can drink at the end of that process. And this is kind of the midway point between the two. Awesome portability, cost is obviously mid-range, um, and accessibility in terms of being able to buy stuff like this is pretty easy. Uh, Claw Hammer do a great job of distributing all through America. Uh, T500 stuff you can get it damn near anywhere. Copperhead is another one of those brands that uh, has a pretty decent reputation. Uh, I won't list off many of them because I haven't tried any of the others at this point in time. If that's something you want to see, uh, perhaps I can look at, you know, getting some more equipment. I think this is kind of the, the range that a lot of new distillers gravitate to. So if you want to see something, let me know. And that last range, that last range is the 50 litre range. I'm not going to bring it over here because it's a pain in the ass to pick up. <laughs> like I was saying before, uh, the, the beauty of that 50 litre range is that it is still movable. It's just a little bit of a pain in the ass. Do you know what I mean? Like if I need to nudge my pot over uh, 10, 15 centimetres because I forgot to have the drain port out over the edge of the table, I can do it when it's full. It's not nice, <laughs> but I can do it. The other wonderful thing about the 50 litre range is that we do have beer kegs and uh, if you're thinking of DIYing or building something I would suggest strongly suggest you look at a 50 litre beer keg uh, it just is a, a sweet spot in terms of being able to make a really decent amount of product uh, if you do three stripping runs with 45 litres in there uh, and then a spirit run at the end you can make a pretty decent amount of product to put on your shelf and um you know, to, to age away. But at that size, you have awesome access to uh, secondhand kegs. Please guys, please, please, please remember, uh, just because you buy a keg full of beer, the keg is not yours. If you keep that thing, it is literally stealing and you're screwing over the, um, the, the company that you bought it from. It's not cool, it's not cool. Don't do that, please. <laughs> Instead, uh, I would suggest you make 
contact with your local craft brewery. Uh, there are always kegs that end up slightly dented, that won't stack properly, that are cosmetically damaged, whatever they happen to be, and they inevitably need to sell those things off. Uh, and brewers and distillers are a great way for that distillery to offload them. And to be honest, most of these craft brewing people they like kind of giving back to the community as well. So that's how I would suggest you end up getting a keg. I need to say a huge, huge thank you to the Patreons. Uh, thank you so much, guys. If you don't know, uh, these are the people that have helped me keep the channel going for this long. So thank you so freaking much to the Patreons. Uh, I really, really do appreciate it, guys. If uh, you out there in internet land are finding these videos helpful and you'd like to help contribute directly to the channel, you can go to chasethecraft.com slash support to find out all the different ways you can help out, uh, one of them being Patreon, if it's right for you. So to wrap that up guys, basically you've got the smaller stills that are great for people that are short on space, um, they're short on time, or they're not really quite sure if they want to get into the hobby or not. Uh, the mid-tier one is kind of a balance of both, funnily enough, and the larger tier one is great for people that know they're into the hobby, that want to upgrade to something bigger, or they want to DIY something themselves and build based on a, uh, a 50 litre keg, which is a great idea, I would recommend it. Uh, so now let's talk about fermenter size. And the reason I want to do this is this is the, the next thing that directly relates to the size of the still that you're getting. And the idea is, once again, regardless of what you're making, if you're making whiskey and double pot stilling it or you're refluxing stuff or, or whatever it happens to be, chances are you're gonna want the ability to do stripping runs into a spirit run, regardless of what you're making. And if you're gonna be doing that, you need roughly, depending on the product, it goes all over the place, three times the still in fermenter size. Now, you don't have to have one fermenter, for example. So what you can do is have a 50 litre still, a 50 litre fermenter, you make a 50 litre wash, you pop it into the still, you do a stripping run and you collect it over here, and then when the fermenter's empty, you make another one. And you just keep doing that until you've got enough to pop back into the still. Which, to be fair, is actually a pretty good strategy for those of you that kind of like to work on a project uh, over a pretty decent amount of time, maybe six, eight weeks to get something finished. Uh, if you're short on time and you know you don't want to be spending a whole, you know, a whole weekend distilling back to back uh, after fermenting once. Uh, so the long and short of it team is that you want a fermenter that is at least the size of your still, uh, but perhaps you want three of those or you want something three times the size. So I've got uh, 20 litre fermenters, I've got a 100 litre fermenter, and I've got a 200 litre fermenter. The great thing to know is that because we're not so worried about the, uh, the hygiene and cleanliness stuff as beer brewers, we can get away with uh, fermenters that aren't airlocked, for example. None of my fermenters at the moment are airlocked, uh, so there's much cheaper options out there in terms of second-hand vessels you can use fermenting. So I hope you found this helpful, guys. If you needed distilling, I hope you found some information here that'll help you get over that initial learning curve hump and uh, get you started. I know it's tricky. I know it's tricky. Keep on keeping on, keep on chasing, and you're going to get there. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up. That helps me out a whole lot. Tells YouTube it's a good video, and it should show it to other people. So helpful. Uh, if you're not subscribed yet and you've seen a few videos uh, and you like what I do, hit the subscribe button down below. And more important than all of that, I'll catch you next time, guys. Keep on chasing the craft. See ya.